Likute Sichais, Chelikut Ches, Volume 18, the second Sicha for Chagasha Voice. This Sicha is going to discuss the connection between three major personalities in Yiddishkeit that have a special connection to Chagasha Voice, namely Moshe Rabbeinu, David Amelech, and the Baal Shemta. So the Rebbe says in the Sicha, as discussed many times, that Shavuos has a special connection with Moshe Rabbeinu, because through him the Torah was given on Shavuos, with David HaMelech, who as we know, passed away on Shavuos, and with the Baal Shem Tev, who was nostalgic, he passed away on the first day of Shavuos. Now since everything is Vashgacha Pratis, so when things come together they have a connection, especially something that's connected to the Jewish people in general, and it's particularly to the Nesiyah Yisrael, to Jewish leaders, so it's understood that there's got to be, there has to be a common point between all three of them, number one. Number two, that there is, the common point has a special connection to Shavuos, and on the other hand, there's also, it's understood that there is a Chidush, there's a novelty in each one over the other, in each one of these three over the other. What is the common point that is between all three of these? That all three of them are firsts, meaning they all set a precedent in the type, in the kind of melucha unesius, in the, so to speak, kingship and superiority. Where do you see this? Moshe Rabbeinu, as we know, he has the status of a king. and He was the first king of Am Yisrael. David HaMelech, was also a first, he set a precedent, as he was the first for Malchus based of it, the dynasty of the house of David. And as the Ramam writes, that once he became king, now from there on, all his children, all his descendants forever, as Hashem promised, the Melucha, the kingship will never leave them, meaning that he set the precedent, he, he began a whole new concept, a whole new chapter. And then the Baal Shem Tev, as we know, he is the first for all the Nesiyah Hasidis, all the leaders of the Hasidic movement. Now from this we can understand the connection between these three and Matan Torah. You see, because in Matan Torah, as Hashem declares in the Torah, we, that is B'nai Yisrael, we became a quote, a Mamleches Koyanim, a kingdom of Koyanim. In other words, we enter the concept of kingship, what, the, the union of Melucha. And where do we get the koyach for this? Where do we get the power? Where do we get the energy? Where do we get the potential for all of this? We get them from the Nesiyah Yisrael, from the Jewish leaders. Now, what exactly does this mean? What is the connection between Mat and Torah and the idea of Melucha, the concept of kingship? So the Rebbe says the idea of Melucha, the concept of kingship is Hisnasus, which means superiority, to be above it all. As we see, that the Melech, a king, according to Halacha, according to Jewish law, is totally superior and removed from the rest of the people. For example, he's not allowed to lower himself, he's not allowed to degrade himself to do any whatsoever kind of Melacha in a way that will degrade his stature, his status amongst the people. Another thing, for example, is that the people are the ones who have to provide for him. And another thing is that no one can stand in his way. We know there's a rule, the Gemara says, Melech put it together, that the king, wherever he chooses to go, he can even plow right through a field. In other words, nothing stands in his way. He is totally superior to the rules and to the normal, uh, to the norm, so to speak, of the regular average person. And likewise, by Yidin, this was accomplished. This, this came about when we were given the Torah. As we say, V'rimam tonu mikol am that Hashem elevated us, He lifted us up above all other nations. And there's nothing that can, that, that not even the rules of nature that can govern us, that can, so to speak, um, control us or in any way uh, handicap us. In other words, when a Yid does what Hashem wants him to do, when a Yid fulfills Hashem's will, then you don't have to even... Um, you don't even have to revert to, you don't even have to rely on, so to speak, on the normal rules of nature. To the extent that really, ideally, the way it's supposed to be when a Yid fulfills Torah mitzvahs 
that he doesn't even have to plow, so to speak. He doesn't even have to engage in normal mundane activities in order to secure his sustenance. That comes through others doing it for him. And in the avoid of each and every individual, we see that when it comes to fulfill a matter of Torah mitzvahs, a yid has to behave, so to speak, like a king. He has to be superior and not allow anything to stand in his way. Nothing in the world can stand in the way of a yid and his ability to fulfill Torah mitzvahs. And it's not that he has to fight with the world, but rather he does it in a way, quote, of menucha, meaning that it happens kind of by itself. It happens in a, in a pleasant manner, in a manner that he happens to be lechatchila above the world and nothing stands in his way. However, a yid can ask, it's one thing if this is discussed, if this is being taught, uh, spoken about in reference to the neshama. In other words, it's understood that the neshama is superior to any whatsoever uh, limitations, any whatsoever, quote, realities of the laws of nature. But if we're talking about the neshama, as it is in the guf, we're talking about a yid that's already in the neshama in the body, then maybe perhaps he is somewhat limited by the laws of nature. How can we say that you can be, quote, above it, superior to it, and it doesn't stand in your way? So here comes the answer, and this is the point of the connection of the Nesia Yisrael, that since they are in a mode of leadership, they are in a mode of Malchus, therefore they provide for each and every Yid the Koyach, the ability that he too should be able to express it in a revealed manner and bring it out in himself, this concept, this idea of being superior to the laws of nature. Now since all three of them, Moshe, David, and the Baal Shem Tov, um, were all Nesim, they were leaders, and they were, quote, Melachim, like kings, therefore, and that, that ruled over the world, and they were superior to the rules, to the status of the laws of nature. Where do we see it? We see Moshe Rabbeinu, that his whole leadership was in a manner of doing nisim, of doing miracles all the time, which is superior, which is beyond, beyond. it is supernatural. David HaMelech, again, we find that so many nisim, so many miracles occurred to him and through him. And then the Baal Shem Tov, as it's well known, the Baal Shem Tov was a Baal Moifis. He did tremendous miracles to the extent that if one wants to refer to something that's so miraculous, usually you refer to it as a Baal Shem this is like a, a Balshemska episode. In other words, it gets the status of the Balshemtiv's whole status is of that of being supernatural, of being miraculous. So that, that is how they bring out the concept of being superior to nature in each and every yid. Now, to understand how each and every one is unique, because we said that besides them having a common common point, there's also uniqueness in each and every one. It says that Rebbe, first we need to explain, we need to better understand the revelation of Matan Torah and how it relates to these three ideas, to these three concepts. And in other words, we're going to first understand the three different stages, so to speak, in Matan Torah. And then through them we can understand how they relate to these three different uh, leaders, to these three different types of leadership. First in Matan Torah we have the actual revelation of godliness that took place on, on, on the Har Sinai. The actual revelation, although it says Hashem came down on Har Sinai and He revealed Himself, but that was only what we call the Fisha. That was only temporary. That means so long that Hashem revealed Himself on Har Sinai, so long that it was there in the cloud, the revelation was taking place. But once Hashem left, once the cloud, once the shofar sounded and Hashem left, so that too, that actual revelation left. That's number one. Number two, another phase, is the outcome. Another aspect of it is the outcome, the effect of Matan Torah. The effect of Matan Torah is that even after Hashem's actual revealed presence left the mountain, still it left an effect, a residual effect, in the nature of the world, that now the world is receptive and it could receive the uh, effects of Torah. In other words, it, 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 it left a permanent effect on the rest of the world. And then number three, that which is the objective of Matan Torah. The objective of Matan Torah, which is to convert the Gashmizdika world, to make a Dira Lo Yizbarech, 
to make a dwelling place to Hashem from the Gashmis of the world, that is something which remains, that is something which is consistently permanent in the world, that's a permanent effect of Matan Teira. And these three um, phases, so to speak, of Matan Teira are reflected in the three different time periods, the three different chapters of the history of Am Yisrael. We, if you break it down, we have Am Yisrael as they were in the Midbar, in the desert. And then you have Am Yisrael as they were after they entered Eretz Yisrael, which is called Eretz Neshevis, a settled land, they already settled into the world. And then you have the third phase, the third Kufa, which is the time of Golas. Now, the Midbar, the time that they were in the desert, those who received the Torah, physically were there present and received the Torah, the effect of Matan Torah remained also evident in their bodies, in their physical existence. And we see that the way they lived for the next 40 years, their existence was Lemaila Min Hateva. It was super to, to nature. It was, be, it was, they had a superiority to nature. And therefore they didn't, they didn't have any contact with the world and they were fed in a supernatural manner. They were sustained and fed in a supernatural manner. However, they remained, so to speak, in the desert. That original uh, generation who received the Torah, the adults, they didn't leave that. In other words, that stayed there. That was, so, so to speak, in a, in a sense, it had a certain temporary air to it. Then there was the second phase, the second Kufa, the second time period, when they went into Eretz Yisrael. True, that now they already had more contact with and they were living in the realities of nature. They had to work the fields and they had to deal with Gashmis and so on. But still, yet, what was the, what was the experience? What was the reality living at Yisrael that they saw godliness, bimuchish, they saw it in a revealed manner? To the extent, as the Pasik says, limtar hashamayim tishtamayim, that Eretz Yisrael relies heavily, exclusively on rain. Now rain is something which you can see literally the hand of God. You see that when you do what Hashem wants, as we say in the second chapter, the second um, paragraph of Kriyashma, that when you fulfill the Torah Mitzvah, then benesati metar Hashem says, I'll give rain. So when you, when you receive rain from the Eivishter, there you see clearly the hand of Hashem. You see directly the guidance of Hashem. That is in the Kufa when they lived in Eretz Yisrael. However, then you have the third Kufa, the third time period, which is the time of Golos. Then there is a total and absolute darkness. And it almost seems like that a Yid is totally bound and beholden to, to, the, uh, to the realities, to the laws of nature. Now this that Matan Torah was only temporary, just to just to just to be sure, it doesn't mean that it was absolutely temporary and didn't leave any residual effect. This did have an effect on the world. I'm sorry, it, it, the fact that it was temporary was only the effect on the world itself, meaning like that, which was evident in in the actual experience on Har Sinai, that it was only temporary, only lasted for the time that Hashem was present there in actuality. But the fact is that it did leave a residual effect on the bodies of Am Yisrael, on the existence of the Yid, meaning not the world, but the Yid, that the Yid now from then on remained, became and remained a Mamleches Kainim, a kingdom of Kainim. Now these three time periods reflect, are reflected in these three leaders, Moshe, David, and the Baal Shem Tov. Moshe, indeed, he affected by the Yidin this idea of Mamleches Kainim to the extent that you see that all their needs were provided for them without them having to work, without them having to do anything and getting involved in Olam Hazem. And that's a reflection of the idea of a king, as we said in the beginning, that a king doesn't have to provide for himself, he is provided for. However, the second phase, the second Nasi, when they came, this is Moshe Rabbeinu, when the second Nasi is when they came to Eretz Yisrael, all this stopped, and now they had to start working the fields, and they had to get involved in Gashmias. True, they saw the bracha coming from Hashem from above, but the fact is that when you work the fields, the fact is that when you were involved in doing your part in generating your Parnassah, 
what happens is that with time, you can sometimes lose focus and forget that it's coming from above. Even though it's clear, but it becomes a little distorted and perhaps sometimes it can seem as if it's coming from nature. And for this came the second major leader, David HaMelech, who gave the Koyach, that even in this Eretz Neshevis, even in Eretz Yisrael, the settled land, they should feel and they should realize that everything comes from above and that they, they are a Mavleches Koyanim, that everything comes from Hashem, but, and therefore, when it comes to the uh, observance of Torah and Mitzvahs, obviously, if one is reminded and one is given the Koyach from the leader of the time to remember that they are Mamlechus Koyanim, obviously, there's nothing standing in their way to actually fulfill Torah and Mitzvahs. However, in the third time period, in the third phase, when it comes to the time of Golis, which and especially late in the latter part of Golis, the most difficult and darkest period of Golis, that the darkness becomes so thick and so heavy that because of the difficulties of the times, people are totally engrossed and involved in trying to earn a living just in the day to day. Then the message, then we needed the message of Hashem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov's light shined then and gave us the direction that even in such a hard, difficult time, there's still a yid is amleches koyenim. A yid is still above nature. A yid is still like a king. He's superior to nature. How did this come about? The Baal Shem Tov revealed the idea of Ashkach HaPratis. That even when you're involved in the world, still the Baal Shem Tov gave us the direction. He gave us the clarity that everything is Ashkach HaPratis, even the most minute detail in your day-to-day life. Thus, a yid, could be, when reflecting on this, a yid comes to the realization that even, quote, the nature of his life is also a miraculous thing. Now, the truth is that this latter phase and concept, meaning this time period of Golos, which is led by the Val Shem Tov and influenced by the Val Shem Tov, is actually far greater and superior to the first two. Why? Because in the first two, you have like a common element of affinity that is, so to speak, natural to it. It's built in. When the Yid is in the desert, he has no distractions whatsoever, and everything's provided to him, and there's only godliness present. Or even when he's in Eretz Yisrael, where he does have to work with the world. But again, still, there is a revelation of godliness all the time. So then the person is more predisposed to this um, uh, concept of superiority to Olam Hazer. He is in a superior state. However, when a Yid is in Golas, and then he's given the ability then he's given the Koyach for the Baal Shem Tov to be able to stand above it, to be able to still feel a superiority to it. Now this is a ultimate infinity. This tells us that this concept is so infinite that even when there are the limitations, yet a Yid can rise above it. Now of course, Chas Shalom to say that all these leaders only affected their respective time, their respective time period. Their time and place, because it's obvious that they have a connection to all the generations. That is, Moshe, as and where do we see it? How do we refer to Moshe? We refer to him as Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, our teacher. That means he has a connection to our times. How do we refer to David Amelech? We don't just say David Amelech from the past. No, we say David Amelech, Melech Yisrael, Chai Vikayim. He exists and he's alive, so to speak, today. His effect is alive. And then the Baal Shem Tov, certainly, as we know, the Baal Shem Tov was told by Mashiach that when will he come? When your teachings, when your wellsprings will spread to the outside. Thus we understand that, that so long that we're going towards Mashiach, most certainly the Baal Shem Tov has an effect on us and is connected to us. However, as they are divided into three time periods and their actual time that they lived, and that they inspire the people in real time. So we understand that this also can be reflected in every single generation, since they are connected to all generations, is reflected in the three different types of Jews, and the three different modes, the three different types of service of a Yid to Hashem, which basically breaks down into Torah, Avoida and Gemilas Chasadim. Torah, the study of Torah, Avoida, which is davening, which is prayer, and Gemilas Chasadim, doing the actual mitzvahs 
or in, in Gemil's Hasadim, literally means doing loving kindness, doing tzedakah, which is in general representative of all the mitzvahs. Toida, of course, is the Indian of Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, where do you see that this has the idea of superiority? Because Toida comes from above. Toida comes milmaila lamata, right? It's, in other words, it's, it is essentially higher than the world. So that is reflective of that time period when the Yidin were in the desert, and this has connection to Moshe Rabbeinu. Then you have the Yid that's more focused on tefillah, and this, of course, is connected to David HaMelech. That's why David HaMelech is the one who composed the Tehillim, which is generally the idea of tefillah. So the, when a Yid is in tefillah, he is above the world. His only connection to the world is that he davens, he asks for, he prays for the things that he needs in this world. But he himself, he is not dear. He is connected to Hashem. He is tefillah. And do you see to the extent that you're not allowed to work, you're not allowed to do anything, you're not allowed to even eat before you daven. So, and David affects, what's this idea of superiority? That the moment that he davens, his tefillah gets fulfilled right away, just like a king that makes a decree and everything happens right away. His, his orders are filled right away. Now the third ty- uh, aspect, the third type in amongst the Bnei Yisrael, which is reflective of the third time period, the time period of Hashem Tev, this is doing the actual mitzvahs, which of course a mitzvah is done and could only be done in and with Oilam Haza, with the worldly things, with natural things. So in here already is reflective how a Yid has a direct connection to the Oilam Haza, to this world. And here's what the Baal Shem Tev affected. That in this world, he revealed that even in Inyana Oilam Haza, there is the Achdus Seishel HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there is the unity of Hashem within the world. This too also, by the way, he affected through Torah. It all goes back. It's all connected to Moshe Rabbeinu. Because how did he affect this? How did he teach this to us? By explaining a Pasuk in the Torah, which is Tehillim slash Torah. But the fact is that Hashem to be revealed to the year that's in the world, in the time of Golis, in, the, I mean, the type of Jew that's involved in the world, that he too should see, he too should realize that Hashem, the unity of Hashem, that Hashem is involved in each and everything, and this gives the Koyach to, to the Yid to be able to deal with and withstand all the problems, all the issues, all the limitations, so to speak, of Inyone Elam Haza. So this is how they all three come together on Shavuos, because this is really ultimately, if you bond it all together, this is the whole objective of Matan Teira, and it brings all three, the entire, so to speak, history of the Jewish people together until the point of Mashiach.